Have you ever noticed that clear-cut issues are easy to answer with a minimum of words? It ought to tell us something, therefore, that because Paul spends fully three chapters on the question of eating meat sacrificed to idols, it might not be a very clear-cut issue. Indeed, following all the twists and turns of Paul's logic can leave us with a case of whiplash, no more sure of what he really means than we were when we started. Hello, I'm Stuart Baskin, pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Tyler, Texas, and this is your daily devotional for Monday, March 28, 2022. So today, at long last, we wrap up Paul's tortuous journey through a question that evidently caused a great deal of conflict among the, among the Corinthian Christians. If you're looking for a final fixed answer to this knotty question, you may come away a little disappointed, even confused. For Paul seems to say in the end, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols, lest you injure the weaker among you and actually offend God. But on the other hand, feel free to eat it as long as you give thanks to God for it. Of course, it's not quite that simple, but that's sure how it reads at first. In this final section of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul begins by quoting a Christian principle that the so-called stronger Christians probably said to him, all things are lawful, meaning in Christ we are free from the strict constraints of the law. But then Paul places a caveat on this principle that still applies today. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. Okay, fair enough. This is a helpful reminder that while at one level we are free, there are limits to our freedom. Whatever works against the building up of the community of faith ought to place a constraint on what we choose to do. If Paul left it there at the level of a general principle, we would probably be happy. It's nice, neat, and a handy guide to Christian living, even if it doesn't offer much in the way of specific guidance. But Paul doesn't leave it there, and this is where it gets a bit confusing. He says, Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth and all its fullness are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it out of consideration for the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I mean the other's conscience, not your own. For why should my liberty be subject to the judgment of someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why should I be denounced because of, of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. So which is it? Am I free to eat meat sacrificed to idols or not? What Paul seems to leave us with is a great big, it depends. At the end of it all, there seem to be two different things going on here. One is eating meat in our own homes that we purchased in the market, but which has been apparently sacrificed to idols. A second is eating in the home of a non-believer where the meat sacrificed to idols is more ceremonial. In the first case, says Paul, feel free if you know that it is just meat and if it's just a family meal. But in the second case, eating meat sacrificed to idols at a neighbor's ta table when it is actively part of the ceremony in which the meat has been sacrificed, then don't eat it. If you're a little confused, you are not alone. What we're seeing here is Paul doing his dead level best to offer guidance when the issue is not clear cut. He sounds a bit like one of our politicians waffling and speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He reminds me a bit of a, of a speech given by the late Mississippi judge Noah Sweat, nicknamed, I kid you not, Soggy Sweat, a speech he gave on the floor of the Mississippi House of Representatives, 
a speech commonly known as the Whiskey Speech, for it came at a time when Mississippi was a dry state but was starting to make noises about legalizing the sale of alcohol. All Mississippi politicians were expected to stand firmly on one side or the other of this contentious issue. So Sweat took the, to the floor and delivered this short speech. It is called the Whiskey Speech. My friends, I had not intended to, to discuss this subject at this particular time. However, I want you to know that I do not shun controversy. On the contrary, I will take a stand on any issue at any time, regardless of how fraught with controversy it might be. You've asked me how I feel about whiskey. All right, here is how I feel about whiskey. If when you say whiskey you mean the devil's brew, the poison scourge, the bloody monster that defiles innocence, dethrones reason, destroys the home, creates misery and poverty, yea, literally takes the bread from the mouths of little children, if you mean the evil drink that topples the Christian man and woman from the pinnacle of righteous, gracious living into the bottomless pit of degradation and despair and shame and helplessness and hopelessness, then certainly I'm against it. But if when you say whiskey, you mean the oil of conversation, the philosophic wine, the ale that is consumed when good fellows get together, that puts a song in their hearts and laughter on their lips and the warm glow of contentment in their eyes, if you mean Christmas cheer, if you mean the stimulating drink that puts the spring in an old gentleman's step on a frosty, crispy morning, if you mean the drink which enables a man to magnify his joy and his happiness and to forget, if only for a little while, life's great tragedies and heartaches and sorrows, if you mean that drink, the sale of which pours into our treasuries untold millions of dollars, which are used to provide tender care for our little crippled children, our blind, our deaf, our dumb, our pitiful, aged, and infirm, to build highways and hospitals and schools, then certainly I am for it. This is my stand. I will not retreat from it. I will not compromise. It's a funny speech, but it contains real wisdom. Like Paul, Judge Sweat understood that this was one of those issues for which there were fiery passions on both sides, but on which truth also lay on both sides. Sometimes the truth is just a little hard to suss out. Judge Sweat knew it. Paul knew it. We all really do know it. Sometimes the best we can do is embrace the dilemma and live in the tension it creates. Sometimes that's the most Christian thing we can do. Tomorrow, another day, another topic of controversy in Corinth. But for now, may God continue to bless you and keep you in all that you do this day and in all the days ahead.